Good morning, everybody. Our scripture reading this morning is from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 18. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with that angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather, to sing, to rejoice in who you are and what you've accomplished. I pray that you would speak to us through your word and through your Holy Spirit in ways that bring about joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning. My name is Mike, and I'm one of the pastors here, and we're in an Advent series. Advent is just uh, means coming, and so we take four weeks to celebrate the coming of Jesus, uh, his birth at Christmas, and then, of course, we anticipate his second coming, and so hence the Advent season, and this week we are focusing on the theme of joy, and uh, I just love the Christmas story, not because I'm like super nostalgic. My wife will tell you when we first got married, you know, I was a lot closer to Scrooge uh, and the Grinch uh, than I was from that sweet little girl in Whoville. What's her name? Sydney, thank you. I don't even know the name. There you go. Cindy Lou Who. So there you go. Um, anyway, um, the story, I mean, we all love stories, honestly. Um, you know, whether you're into like books and movies and film, which obviously the multi billion dollar in- industry that all of that is. Or, you know, you're into music, you know, all music, you know, they tell stories, and so you're into the stories, and you want to know what your artist is doing and why they wrote it, and if you're into sports, it's like you don't just, like, look at the numbers in the box score, you want to know who played and why they played, you want to know the story, and that's built into us here because the scriptures is a story, and Jesus' birth is kind of like his birth, death, resurrection is like the epicenter of that story. And then as we look at the lives of the people in and around that story, namely Jesus himself, there's so much that we can glean as we're seeking to live out our stories. And so I think that's probably closer to why I love this. And so what we're going to do this morning is look at you know, the announcement of Jesus to these shepherds, and then there's this phrase in there that is like great joy. Uh, the Greek says, there's an easy correlation in the English, mega, mega joy. So apparently there's a strand of mega joy in this story, and I want to know about it. <laughs> and I want to enter into it. I want to participate in it. And if that's what Christmas, at least is, a, I wouldn't say that joy necessarily has to be the center of the Christmas story, but it's real close. And so all of us I know want to be happy. Okay? You're looking to be happy. I'm looking to be happy. You know, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Um, And so this story, I think, has something to teach us about what it means to experience genuine mega joy in following Jesus. So what I want to do this morning is look at basically kind of three, you could call them like keys, three uh, like essential components that if you want to experience the kind of joy that Jesus was offering and that Jesus was bringing, these need to be a part of your Christian experience. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, you don't identify as a Christian, then Jesus is certainly inviting you into saying, hey, if you get connected with me, there's a mega joy involved. And so certainly there would be a wide open invitation from Jesus and his word to anyone who is seeking him. So let's look at the first, 
basically three things, three H's this morning. The first one is that if you're going to experience joy, then you have to cultivate humility. Okay? Pretty simple. Humility is not thinking negative thoughts about yourself in some kind of like self-righteous way because that's the right thing to do. That's not what humility is. It's not just like, oh, I'm such a bad person and oh, blah, blah, blah. Now, if you are a bad person, that could be humility, okay? Because <laughs> here's what humility is. Humility is recognizing actually who you are, not in relationship to the other people around you because you weren't primarily created to relate to the people around you. You were primarily related to, or primarily created to relate to God. And so what humility is, is just a proper view of yourself in light of God. It's not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking real about yourself. So if you wanna be happy, then you need to stop fronting. <laughs> you, know, you know what fronting means? That means you need to drop the facade. Stop acting like you're better than you are. Then you can start to be happy. And when you look at the Christmas story, that's what's happening here. When the angels come and announce to the shepherds, which there's so many things about this story that are just full of wonder when you think about it. I mean, of all of the people to pick, I mean, I know this has been well-worn, but it's still, this story, uh, you know, I look at this like evergreen tree here. The Christmas story is evergreen. It's never not fresh. It is full of wonder that the Lord would send a heavenly host to speak to those shepherds. I mean, if you were trying to get the word out today, just not how you would do it. But anyway, so he appears on the hillside. These angels appear to the shepherds, and they say, good news, great joy. A Savior is born who is the Lord. He's the anointed king. <laughs> and if you're a shepherd on the hill, you're not going to be like, yes. I don't need a savior. I don't want that king. There's no joy unless the shepherds know deep in their heart, I have a need. I need saving. And I need a different king than the one I have. And if that's the case, then wow, this is great. Great joy. But if you don't think you need a savior and you don't want Jesus as king, then there's not going to be any joy for you. Well, that's not true. Say it carefully. You'll get the kind of joy that the saviors and kings that you have can offer. That's what you'll get. So I stand corrected. <laughs> I correct myself. So, you know, this, this promise doesn't just come out of nowhere. I mean, there's, you know, this is this part of the story. There's a lot before, okay? The first part of the Bible, the Old Testament, is just the long, sad story of human beings trying to find happiness in other things. That's C.S. Lewis' quote. I think I have that up here for you. C.S. Lewis, do I have that, guys? No, I don't. All right. That's pretty close to the exact quote. <laughs> the Old Testament begins, the story begins with God creating us perfectly in his image in the garden perfect fellowship with god perfect fellowship with this with each other with the nat with nature around us and then we sin and rebel against god through the influence of evil spiritual forces satan and then this like darkness comes over the human race our sin and our rebellion is like this dark hardening cloud in our souls and then as you go through the old testament you start to see that darkness manifest itself cain kills abel you know, and it just, I mean, as the human race expands, it just, it's like all kinds of just corruption and darkness. So that is expanding and growing. And yet amidst that darkness, in the beginning, in Genesis chapter 3, God made a promise that through the offspring of a woman, through the birth of a son, 
light would come into that darkness and would eventually overcome that darkness. And so you've got these two strands that are just kind of emanating from the beginning of the story, the kind of viral spread of darkness and hardening and rebellion against God in all of its various kinds of form of you know, abuse and disobedience and war and all kinds of things, and yet through the midst of that, there's kind of like beating or pulsing this, this flickering little light that is hanging on to that a son is gonna come and be born. And at pivotal moments in the story, if you're familiar, it's like, you know, Abraham was promised a son and that son was miraculously born and then the next generation was miraculously born. You look at Moses who was a son that was protected by the midwives of Israel and and the promise of God was protected through that and then God promised that a king would come and God would make that king his son and that king was David but David's line and his son, they're a hot mess. And so you get down to the end of the story in the Old Testament and it's like there's all this darkness around us, the promise still remains but it hasn't been fulfilled. And then, on a hillside to a bunch of shepherds or to a teenage girl named Mary or to an old faithful priest whose marriage they were barren for decades, the announcement comes from the angel Gabriel that the one who had been promised, the son who, he's coming. And what do all of those people do? They all rejoice. When Mary hears about what happened, what's gonna happen to her, After the angel leaves, she writes a song and she says, my soul rejoices in God, my savior. Elizabeth, when she gets the news that she's gonna bear a son who's gonna be the forerunner to the king, she rejoices. Zechariah, eh, (laughs) if you know the story, Zechariah, he didn't rejoice at first. He doubted at first, but then after, you know, and so the Lord shut his mouth, and th- that was a sign that, hey, I'm actually gonna do this, and to, as a, you're asking for a sign, the sign is that your mouth is closed. <laughs> And then once his mouth is open, what does Zechariah do? He writes a song and rejoices. And so what all of those people have in common is that when they hear the news, they respond with joy because they are looking for and wanting a savior and a king. Different than the current saviors and kings that were offered to them in other places. And so if you want to experience joy, you have to be humble and you have to receive the announcement that Jesus is Savior and King as something that you want and you need. So, second, if you want to be joyful, not only do you need to be humble, but you need to have hope. You see, each of, each of the people, and that's you know, the shepherds, Mary, Zechariah, Elizabeth, each of those people, when they received the news and they actually saw what happened, that, oh yeah, in fact, here is the Savior, the King, the babe, we actually see him, like they began to experience him, not everything changed for them just like that. I mean, again, imagine that you're one of the shepherds. And let's say you were like 20 years old when this happened to you. You're on the hillside, you're 20, boom, angelic heavenly host, this was amazing. You like go tell everyone around Bethlehem and Judah and all that. (laughs) And then one year, two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years goes by and nothing has happened. (laughs) <laughs> and you're talking with your buddy who was also there that day. <laughs> he was maybe a little older. So now you're 45 and he's 55. You're like, you remember like 25 years ago? Angels? Were we drunk? Like, like <laughs> what happened? So they had to wait. Then you look at Mary, and she receives this amazing promise that her son is gonna be the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of God, who's gonna take over the throne of David, and she lives all those years with him, and then she's there with him at the cross, and so apparently the joy is there, the power of that is there, and yet it's not like the absence at this point of the story of all the suffering and the sighing. I love that part in the reading that we had this morning. The sighing, how much of life is just, 
oh well it is what it is oh well i guess that oh man this, this is really hard like all of these things that we suffer through and so the joy that jesus is going to bring to our lives is not meant to be the superficial passing kind, the fleeting kind, but the deep kind that carries you through the sufferings and sorrows of this world. And the way that that happens is through hope in the promises of God, that he is who he says he is and he will do what he says he will do. One of the great examples of this to show you just how like this just this is how it works. You know, for those of you who are into like, well, how does it work? How does joy function? So for all the engineers in the room, okay? <laughs> we'll move from a story to mechanics. Ready? First Peter chapter one. Verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable. So let me just stop right, right now because of who Christ is for you now and in the past and this inheritance that is coming to you. You get the joy now even though you haven't experienced the fullness yet. Now again, this is actually not rocket science. You do this every day. When something negative happens to you, this is what happens. You say, well, I had this really difficult situation at work. Maybe even I lost my job. And then you go, oh, but at least I still have my family. And so you put your hope in your family and it gives you strength to get through the trial of losing your job. Or vice versa. You say, something really negative happened to me and my family, but at least I have this over here. The at least I have is your hope, and you are doing that all the time. That goes back to the shepherds and the savior and the king situation. You're saying, you know, good news, great joy, even though this, real, this situation really is difficult, good news, great joy, I have my family, I have my job, I have this meal, I have whatever, I have whatever it is I have. And when you run out of the whatever else I have, then you start talking about the dark, you're in a dark place. Now here's Here's what the beauty of being a Christian is. And it's like, man, if I could just get inside my own heart and make this happen and do it in you guys too, just this is the thing, guys. I'm telling you, this is it. What you need to do is, this is not my words. Look at verse 13. Therefore, well, no, actually, let me go back to verse 7 because he actually brings trials in. In this, your future inheritance, you rejoice now, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved through various trials. So it's like you don't have to raise your hand. Who is currently being grieved through a trial? Or who knows somebody that's doing that? So how do you get the joy when you're being grieved? Future inheritance. So now verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, get ready, being sober-minded, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Don't put your hope when this goes bad, I'll just eat my way out of it. <laughs> Sorry. It's not gonna do it. You'll only get what food can give you. You'll only get what your friends can give you or your family or who, whatever the savior and king that you'll look to, you'll get something, but in the end, they'll let you down and betray you. And so as followers of Jesus, we need to learn to go, I am so happy because of what Jesus is gonna do for me in the end. And I, I feel like we've lost that skill. We've lost the strength to be able to do that. I feel like, you know, we sing songs like that, you know, like, that's why we sing the songs that we sing. And when it doesn't connect with us, it's like kind of like being at a comedy show and you don't get the joke. <laughs> it's like everyone else in here seems to be happy. <laughs> why are they happy? I don't know if they are or not. That could be a bad way to think. But if somebody is, and they're going through a trial and yet they still experience joy, 
Most likely, it's because they've set their mind on Jesus and not their current situation. And when you live that way, people stand up and notice. Something's different, yeah. The kingdom of God, good news, great joy. A savior has been born who is Christ the Lord and he is Lord over my circumstances. You know, (laughs) those other saviors that we look to, the reason that they all fail is because none of them can stand up to the greatest threats to our lives, which are the darkness, the ego, the selfishness, the lust, the greed, the self-centeredness that we all have, if we're honest. Again, if we're just being humble, that's not me saying, you know, and honestly, probably some of you do more of that than less, but when you compare yourself to God and what he's designed you to be, there's this darkness over all of us, and then that's not even the worst of it. The worst of it is that there is this great enemy, capital D, death. You're born into a world where you are going to die. You've got, death is your master. He's in control of you, and he'll take you out the way he wants to take you out. And there's nothing you can do about it. Merry Christmas. (laughs) (laughs) That's the point. Good news, great joy, a savior who beat sin and who beat death. And so learn to put your hope in him. Set it fully there. Now, that all that being said, one of the ways King Jesus ministers hope to you is through these means. Celebrate a good meal with friends in the name of Jesus. Put your hope in Jesus. Come to the gathering and sing the songs even when it hurts. You learn to celebrate and sing, sing, sing. So if you're going to be happy, which I really am happy even though I'm crying a little bit, (laughs) that's what happiness looks like for me, okay? Don't judge me. You've got to be humble. You've got to learn to put your hope in Jesus and not the other saviors and kings. And finally, you have to embrace the holiness of King Jesus. And what I mean by holy, not just me, what the Bible means is that he is unique. There's no one else like him, and so that should solicit from you a wholehearted devotion to him. Did you follow? No one else like Jesus. He's the only savior and king that can do all of those things that we just discussed, and so because of that, my allegiance and my devotion is wholeheartedly given to him. And that means two things, I would say. And you can see it illustrated in the story. One, your wholehearted devotion is illustrated by your willingness to jump in with two feet. To get in. The shepherds, when they heard the angelic announcement, they weren't like, huh, what do you think? Nah, I will stay. No. <laughs> they ran, it says. They two-timed it to, to Bethlehem. That's an interesting response. Scripture says Mary pondered all these things. She stored them up all in her hearts, in her heart. There's a very interesting contrast between the shepherds, which is why I think they got the original announcement. The Lord knew they were humble. The Lord knew they would put their hope. So he's not going to make an announcement of people who are going to like yawn and be like, huh, whatever. The yawn whatever crowd did hear the news. You know who that was? King Herod. In Matthew chapter 2, there's these other guys that show up, which this is also interesting. This is like, you know, the shepherds were like, yeah, we're going to run and find out what happened. And the wise men are like, you know, I see your two-mile jaunt, and I'll give you a 500-mile trek. They saw what was happening, and being Gentile outsiders, different religion and all of that, they went hundreds of miles to come and worship the newborn king. Talk about being in. And so they show up in Jerusalem with their entourage, and they're like, yeah, where's the king? And Herod's like, I'm not sure. 
So he consults his local wise men, and this is what's fascinating to me, they knew. When Herod's like, where's the Messiah gonna be born? They're like, Bethlehem. These people knew, and when they heard the announcement, nobody went. I mean, that's insane to me. If you came to me right now and said, Jesus is born on the earth, I'm just like, where is he? The jungles of wherever, I'm in. Sell everything I have, kiddos, get your backpacks, because we're going. These, he was miles away, and Herod and his wise men, the elite of Jerusalem, because that's what it says in Matthew 2, it says that Herod and all Jerusalem were troubled by this news. Matthew is, doesn't have any fond affection for the Jewish leadership of Jesus' day. That's what he means by Jerusalem. It doesn't mean every single person, but as you read the biography of Matthew, how he recounts these people, these Jewish leaders who had no time for Jesus, apparently Matthew had very little time for them as well. So the elites, again, who were proud, who didn't think, they didn't want a savior and a king. And so for them, the, the message wasn't joy, 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 it was fear, fear, fear. So, <laughs> there's not only one response to this news. And so they didn't experience joy because they didn't see Jesus as holy. There was nothing unique and special about him. And so rather than get close, I like that language this morning, get close. You can't experience the joy of Christ unless you give yourself to him. You can't hedge and still get the joy. The joy comes with the surrender. The joy comes by being close. And not just by being close, but then by walking in obedience. If Jesus is my savior and my king, and he's delivered me from sin and death, he's the greatest threats, and he's given me this great hope, then I can trust him when it comes to his wisdom and his instructions about how to guide and govern my life. And as the story of Jesus, of course, unfolds, that's what, his, that's what discipleship means. It means to be with Jesus, to get close, to become like Jesus, so that we might live lives of love like Jesus in the world. So, in conclusion, I want to go back and just read this again. This angelic announcement of good news. Chapter 2 and verse 10. The angel said, don't be afraid. Could translate to us here, New City, don't be afraid. I've got good news of great joy for you. Even if it's at night, which is where this announcement happened, symbolically representing the darkness, the suffering, the sin, and the shame that we all live in. It's not an accident that these angels appeared at night and that Jesus was born at night because he came to us in our darkness. Fear not, new city, for behold, I bring you good news in your night of great joy. That's gonna be for all the people. Are you young, are you old, are you rich, are you poor? Whatever your ethnicity is, whatever your background is, this news of, this good news of great joy is for you, for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, the city of the king, a savior. You have been given a son who is a savior to deliver you from sin, suffering, grief, who is Christ the Lord. He is the king. <laughs> this morning as I was singing Joy to the World, which I have sung probably a thousand times had this kind of like fresh revelation. You know that line that says, he rules the world with truth and grace? I'm a little bit of a cynic sometimes, and so I'm like, well, it doesn't seem like he's ruling to me. I mean, look at the problems here, look at the problems there. It's like everywhere I seem to go on this earth, there's problems. And so in what meaningful way is Jesus ruling? And then it just hit me. The song answers, with truth and grace. Meaning, he has promised that he will come and make all things right. He will judge the living and the dead. And so even when I look around right now, it's not that he's not ruling, he will rule. He will, in a sense, impose righteousness and justice. He just hasn't done it yet because he rules with truth and grace. 
He's giving people time to repent and make their peace so they can be made right with God. He is ruling. So good news, New City. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Father, I pray that you would give us humble hearts to receive this news. Please, train us in Christ to set our hope on Him and His promises. And I pray that you would have our hearts full of devotion and obedience. In Jesus' name, amen.